let's talk about reducing hazards. Before we do that, let's, have a, let's make sure we have a good understanding of how we assess toxicity. We're going to use a value, a scientific value called LD50. And the LD50, that stands for lethal dose 50%. Lethal like dead. We could call it a dead dose 50 if we wanted. But we're going to use a fancier word. We're going to use the word lethal. And 50, the 50 stands for 50%. So this is an important term or an important concept to get down when you're thinking about pesticide risk. So here's a simple definition. That LD50, it's the concentration of the pesticide in a laboratory test. Now think of rats in cages. So it's that concentration of the pesticide in a laboratory test that'll kill 50% of the test organisms. Now the LD50 value is expressed in milligrams per kilogram. So since this is the United States, uh, most people, except for scientists, are not that conversant with these terms milligram and kilogram. So let's put them into some kind of frame of reference here. Everybody knows or has a sense that a gram is a small amount of weight. Well, a milligram, it takes 1,000 milligrams even to make a gram. So a milligram, it's a very tiny amount of weight. A kilogram, on the other hand, uh, it's just over two pounds. So if you did that arithmetic, if I said that a concentration of something was 10 milligrams per kilogram, another way to say that is 10 parts per million or 10 ppm. All of these things mean the same thing. So the LD50 value, if I say that it's 10 milligrams per kilogram, what I'm saying is it takes 10 milligrams of that chemical per kilogram of rat weight to kill 50% of that rat population. Now, don't get confused here. There's nothing magical about the 50. It's just an arbitrary number that scientists use to compare the toxicity of one compound to another. Now, I think it's interesting to put this, or valuable to put this in some kind of frame of reference. So all pesticides in the United States, all of them, from agricultural, you know, on the farm pesticides to toilet bowl cleaners, are put into categories based on their acute toxicity, based on their acute oral rat toxicity. So the four categories, we're going to start from the bottom. Category four is the practically non-toxic range. These are for LD50 values of greater than 5,000 parts per million. So what this means is it takes 5,000 milligrams of that chemical for each kilogram of rat weight to kill those rats or kill 50% of that population. That's a large number, and a large number means not that toxic. To put it in some kind of frame of understanding that's good for all of us, that's like table salt toxicity. Category three, those are the slightly toxic pesticides. Their LD50 values are 500 to 5,000 parts per million. Category two, now we're getting more toxic as we go along here. Category two are the moderately toxic pesticides. These have rat LD50 values of 500 to 50. And finally, at the top is category one, the very highly toxic pesticides. These are for LD50 values less than 50. So let's look at some common compounds that we all have exposure to all the time and look at their relative LD50 values. Sugar, sugar, around 30,000 parts per million. That is uh, not very toxic from an acute standpoint, right? In other words, what I mean is you'd have to eat a lot of sugar at one setting to kill yourself. Salt, salt is about 10 times more toxic than sugar. But neither one of them are particularly toxic. Both of them are in the slightly toxic to practically practically non-toxic range. Alcohol. Alcohol is about in the same range of toxicity as salt. 2,000 for alcohol, 3,000 for salt. Caffeine. Now we're getting more toxic. Pure caffeine itself, its LD50 value is around 190, so about 10 times more toxic than alcohol. I'm going to ask you a question here. Think about it. I'm not going to give you the answer right now. If caffeine is 10 times more toxic than alcohol, how come no one ever dies when they go to Starbucks but people can binge drink and die at a frat party. Cyanide, very toxic. Its LD50 value is even less than 10. It's seven parts per million. Now, cyanide is not a pesticide, just using that as an example of a very toxic material. So when a pesticide is registered in the United States, before it can be approved, the manufacturer has to provide a lot of information, a lot of scientific information to the federal and state governments. Some of this information includes oral toxicity, like how toxic is the compound if you ingest it. Dermal toxicity, how toxic is that pesticide if it gets on your skin? And inhalation toxicity, 
How toxic is it if you breathe it? Now these values, oral, dermal, and inhalation toxicity, they're the values, they're the numbers that we use to put pesticides in their categories, one through four, and establish something called a signal word. The signal word appears on the pesticide label, and it's your first and best indication of the risk that that pesticide poses to you. So let's take it from the top, the most toxic. Category one, the signal word is danger. These are the very highly toxic pesticides with RAT LD50 values of less than 50 parts per million. Category two, the signal word is warning. These are the moderately toxic compounds, LD50 values from 50 to 500. Category three, the signal word is caution. These are the slightly toxic, down to the practically non-toxic range. The LD50 values are getting bigger here, right? Around 500 parts per million. And then finally, category four, no signal word. These compounds are so low in toxicity risk that they actually don't have a signal word. Ordinarily, most category one pesticide products, they have not only the word danger as a signal word, but they also include the word poison and a graphic of the skull and crossbones. Danger, poison, skull and crossbones. If that doesn't get your attention, I don't know what will. That means that that, that compound is an oral toxicant. If you ingest it, there's a very good chance you're going to die. But there are pesticides that just have a danger signal word. It doesn't have the word poison, and it doesn't have the skull and crossbones. When you see that on a pesticide, what that means is that pesticide, its oral LD50 value is probably a relatively large number. In other words, it's not that toxic. But that compound, that chemical, is corrosive to your eyes and skin. So if you just see the word danger, that means that chemical is very dangerous for your eyes and skin. Now here's some examples of those. The first uh, two are herbicides, 2,4-D amine products, or triclopyr amine products. Triclopyr would be the, the active ingredient in Garlon or Turflon. And there are a number of different 2,4-D products. Uh, Weed R64 is a 2,4-D amine product. You'll see that those herbicides, both of those, have danger on the, as a signal word, but not including the poison word or the skull and crossbones. That means eye and skin risk. Also, disinfectants and toilet bowl cleaners. These are also compounds that are caustic to your eyes. Go home, if you don't believe me on this, go home and look at your toilet bowl cleaner. It'll say danger on there. And furthermore, it'll have a narrative description of the risk to your eyes. So I'm often asked to put risk or hazard into more easily understandable terms. So you know what? Let's do that right now. And we're going to use an example uh, of something that a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, glyphosate-based herbicides. Now, if you don't know the word glyphosate, it's the active ingredient, it's the herbicide part to products like Roundup or Aquamaster or um, Rodeo. So it's that active ingredient in those products. So if we look at the LD50 value, the rat oral LD50 value for glyphosate acid, you're going to see that it's not particularly toxic. The LD50 value is around three to 5,000. So a relatively large number, signifying that it's not particularly toxic. In fact, kind of in the table salt toxicity range. Now, since this is science, we've got to convert everything over to milligrams and kilograms. So you'll have to forgive me here. But let's take a 175-pound man, and let's convert pounds to kilograms. That puts us at 79.5 kilograms. So looking at that LD50 value of 5,000 milligrams per kilogram, a 79.5 kilogram human a lethal dose for them would be um, about 0.9 pounds. Now, at this point, you may be asking yourself, well, I thought these herbicides were liquids, and now you're talking about pounds, and that doesn't make any sense. So let's, let's use a little conversion that you can find right on the herbicide label. If you look on the herbicide label right near the active ingredient statement, you're going to see a conversion. And the conversion tells you that for products like Roundup Pro Max, which is a glyphosate-based herbicide, for every gallon of that liquid product, you have 5.5 pounds of the glyphosate acid. So if you do all that arithmetic, it means that a lethal dose to a 175-pound man would be around 1.3 pints. You would have to drink just over a pint to get in the range of a lethal dose. Now, it doesn't happen very often. But occasionally, people do kill themselves using pesticides. It's an unpleasant topic, but it, it affords us an opportunity to look at some numbers here. Now, it's believed that human illness symptoms related to formulated glyphosate products 
have more to do with the surfactant that's in the container rather than the glyphosate itself. The surfactant, for this period, for this time right now, let's think of it like a soap that helps the pesticide, in this case the herbicide, get into the leaves of the weed target. So it's believed that perhaps the illness symptoms experienced by humans when they ingest formulated glyphosate has more to do with the surfactant, the soap-like stuff, rather than the glyphosate itself. In a review of over 80 intentional ingestion cases people, where people were purposefully ingesting glyphosate-based herbicides, you get a, the same kind of symptoms popping up all the time. Erosion of the gastrointestinal tract, the, the gut. You get some uh, erosion damage to the gut. Difficulty swallowing, that would make sense too because the GI tract actually includes your esophagus, your, uh, the tube that you, the food goes down, right? Gastrointestinal hemorrhage or bleeding in the gastrointestinal site. So those are the kind of symptoms that would develop if you purposefully ingested uh, more than a pint of a glyphosate-based product. The next thing we want to talk about is the difference between a formulation and what's an inert ingredient and what's an active ingredient or an AI or an acid equivalent, an AE. These are terms that are used all the time with different pesticides. So the formulation, think of that as that's the thing that's in the jug. When you go to buy it at the store, you're buying a formulated product. That formulated product can be broken down into two components. The active ingredient, the pesticide part, in the case of Roundup type products, it's glyphosate, and the inert ingredients or the part in the formulation, the component of the formulation that is not pesticidal. Now the inerts, if you look at a pesticide label, they're not identified. The label will say the percent active ingredient, and it'll just sell, tell you the percent of the inerts. Now, that's making it sound like it's a secret, but it's not as actual, it's not as secret like you might think it might be. If, if you look on the product's material safety data sheet, if the inert ingredients are considered to be hazardous by the US EPA, then the material safety data sheet will have to identify those hazardous inerts. Now, not all the time, but a lot of time, the main inert in liquid pesticides is often just distilled water. It's a very common uh, inert, and it usually comprises the majority of what's in that container. Other inert ingredients might include uh, surfactants, right? The surfactants are those compounds that help that pesticide get into the leaf or stick on the leaf. Or solvents, like petroleum-based solvents that help the oil-based pesticides stay in solution so they don't separate. Or in the case of dry pesticides like dusts, uh, mineral, mineral materials. But let's get back to reducing hazard. Now it's like arithmetic. You can't reduce toxicity. There's nothing you can do about toxicity. You can't change it. You know, really the only thing you can do is uh, once you decide to use pesticide A, if you think pesticide A is too toxic, the only way you can change toxicity is not use pesticide A. Just decide to use something less toxic, pesticide B. So the only thing that you can do besides choosing a less toxic pesticide is reduce exposure. So there are a couple of main ways you're going to reduce exposure. First off would be something like an, an engineering control. Some kind of, uh, well, here's a great example. Let's say you're a farmer and you're applying pesticides. If you're, in a, if you're using a tractor to apply those pesticides, if you're in an enclosed cab in that tractor, or maybe a crop duster that's flying the pesticide on by aircraft, if you're in an enclosed cab, that enclosed cab is an engineered way to reduce pesticide exposure. Another example, a simpler one, would be water-soluble bags. A lot of dry pesticides, instead of opening up the bag and pouring it into the water tank, the bag itself dissolves in water, so you don't have to open it. You just toss that water-soluble bag into the tank, you don't have to open it. That reduces your exposure. Hygiene practices, just something as simple as after handling pesticides, wash your hands before handling food. That's probably the most important way to reduce an oral or ingestion exposure. Personal protective equipment or safety gear or PPE, we refer to these things a lot of different ways. I'll probably just call it safety gear. You're going to find that that's probably the most important way that a pesticide handler can reduce risk by reducing exposure. We've come to the end of this section on reducing pesticide hazard, and it's time for you to take a quiz. Good luck.